recording on. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, good morning. Uh, this is the Getting Started for Rhino 7 for Mac. Um, I am Mary Fuchier, and I'm your instructor for this course. Uh, our project today that's hiding behind our sticky note there um, is uh, a backyard studio or guest house. Um, over the past year, I think everyone's been looking for a little more room, whether it's some office space away from the family or if um, you have relatives or somebody staying with you a place uh, to give them to social distance and, and uh, let everybody have their space. So I came up with this um, idea as uh, a project for today's class. Plus, um, we have a lot of product design, getting started, and um, my um, coworker, Kyle Hutchins, he and I do these getting started once uh, a month. And Kyle is a, a transportation designer. He's a product designer. He does toys, does great tutorials. But um, when it comes to architectural, um, that's kind of uh, my... Uh, uh, my area of expertise. So um, I wanted to come up with a design that we could do during class and um, things uh, in an architectural model can get complicated very fast. So I wanted to keep this focused and simple and something that was um, a doable during a, a two hour session. Uh, of course, we are recording so you can go back through the recording and you can, um, you know, redo or you can, um, you know, stop at a certain area that you had issue. Okay, um, so getting the um, files for today's class will uh, will be important. Getting those um, unzipped, and I'll show you kind of what uh, I have uh, going here. Okay, so um, these are the materials for today's class. And we asked that you would have uh, maybe a, a chance to go through this uh, getting started. Uh, it talks about a lot of the uh, resources we have for learning Rhino. We're going to uh, review them. If you haven't done it, you can do it after the class, but it's a little going to be at a little slower pace than we're moving at uh, today. So that can be done after the class. Um, if you have um, Rhino open on one monitor, if you're lucky enough to have two monitors and have the go to training on another or maybe the video on another, that will uh, that will give you the uh, best opportunity to use Rhino, start and stop the video, and uh, take a little extra time where you need it. So the video will be very, um, very helpful as you're reviewing uh, today's class. Now we have the uh, recordings of the previous Rhino 7 getting started, and this will be where uh, the video for today's getting started will be uh, posted. So um, it's also on the materials page. You can get to that after class from uh, the email. And there's a combination of product design and some requests that customers have made, like this little part model here, we went into layouts. Um, that was done as a customer request. And then a few other kind of fun things that uh, uh, we did. Um, in our getting started. So those are worth looking at. Um, Rhino 6, nearly identical. So if you're looking for some additional videos to go through, again, uh, mostly uh, product design, um, but some fun ones too that can lead into fabrication like this uh, child's rocker. Take a look at the Rhino 6 uh, page. So those um, are some uh, important uh, links that are out on the materials page. So here is the uh, PDF. Um, and what we did is just print a PDF from the uh, Rhino, uh, from the Rhino layout. Uh, the Mac has a save PDF or you can go to PDF viewer off the print command. So we'll take a look at that. So um, we have one model 
That model is clipped so that we can see the floor plan. We have three parallel views down here that are all generated off the model. So if I come in here and add another post to the uh, uh, overhang or I copy the railing, it's going to appear in all the views where it is visible. So um, none of these are 2D geometries. All, the, all this is 3D. Okay, we added dimensions. The detail view on the layout is set to a scale. We add dimensions and then we can produce um, our 2D um, output, in this case, PDF uh, from there. So um, that um, has dimensions on. If you're wondering where I'm getting them, sometimes I will make them up as we're going through the model if I decide something will uh, work a little better, but that gives us a pretty good uh, loose uh, framework to, uh, to go from. Um, there's also a PDF called uh, Commands to Know in Rhino. So this is another way if you're trying to uh, fill in um, what you know about Rhino and what you don't, you can look up each of these commands in the Rhino help. The help is available on a side inspector panel, so it's really easy to get to. But that is um, that's uh, from um, one of our uh, Rhino ART, Steve Fuchs. So he put that together for his class. He teaches down at Orange Coast uh, College, uh, Rhino uh, and Fabrication. So really great program if you're ever looking for uh, a way to um, take some on-site, uh, an on-site program with uh, Rhino, with the machines that uh, produce the Rhino geometry. Um, this is also what I call cheat sheet. I also uh, uh, assign it for homework. So um, depending on what your input device is, either a trackpad or a two or three button mouse, um, I want you to be able to zoom, pan, and rotate in the Rhino viewport. And most of the time you'll probably use the three button mouse like I am with the wheel. And uh, um, that's probably the most comfortable. Uh, you could be using uh, a Bluetooth uh, version of that or a corded version of that like, uh, like I am. But um, you do have to be able to navigate, especially these, uh, these three um, important controls uh, zoom, pan, and rotate. Um, you can use your trackpad, and I do from time to time. Um, the same issue we have with the perspective view, the right mouse button uh, rotates the view, so you have to hold the shift key down in order to pan. And if you are doing a tutorial that was done on Windows Rhino, um, you can do it. All you have to do is every time you hear control, exchange it for the Mac command key. And just about everything will work the same. There are a little, uh, a few minor differences in the display, but they're getting closer and closer, especially in Rhino 7. So one thing Rhino 7 did is open up these tabbed toolbars across the top. Now those were available in Rhino 5 and 6 for Mac, but you had to turn them on. So if I go up here to Rhino 7 and down to Preferences and Themes, you'll notice that um, we have the um, default theme here to show the uh, top um, to include the uh, sidebar. Now you could you could turn that uh, off. You can also turn on more inspectors and uh, right now we're set to default, but you can go to custom. And if you want to go back to the single toolbar, the way Rhino 5 looked, you could. But you had to turn this on. And kind of strangely enough, in 5 and 6, it was called the Windows theme. And that, for those who'd never used Windows, it didn't really make a whole lot of sense. So anyway, it's now the default, which is great, because I don't have to have you go turn those on. So. Um, we have those all available. Now, when you, if you look across the top here, the menu, I'm probably going to use the menu most of the time, but we're going to combine it with the help 
uh, inspector, and I'll look at that here in a minute. One thing that the menu does is, is give us a really good idea, an indication of how the geometry is going to build in Rhino. So we'll make a curve, we might make a surface out of it, and then we can take those curves or surfaces and use them for input into solids, so extrusions, um, and those extrusions can be cut with curves um, with some of the tools that we're going to use called wire cuts. So um, if you are going to 3D print this, it would be important to keep all the geometry closed, and that where wire, that's where wire cut comes in. If your goal is just to uh, do a rendering, then you don't have to be that kind of meticulous about keeping keeping things uh, closed, but um, again, it's a quick way to model and it keeps uh, your geometry uh, clean and, and without uh, kind of extra surfaces. So um, modeling with solids can be a very uh, efficient uh, way to go. Um, right above the toolbars and right below the menu, we have our modeling uh, aids. So if I get out of the command, we're going to um, talk about Gumball and we can turn all of them off for now. We'll probably use Smart Track, Ortho, and Snap as well. But these are our modeling aids. And right below them, we have our menu bar. And if I pick on curve tools, for example, one of the commands we're going to use a lot in this tutorial is offset curve. So you can take that right from here, but you can also look over here at the sidebar. And there's some other important tools like um, join and um, explode curves into individual parts and then curve creation and then uh, of course uh, trim. So if I go back to standard you'll see that update with a little bit more generic approach. Now some of these toolbars, I should say some of these toolbar buttons are not just one command, they actually have a whole series of commands in them. So if I pick here on object snap, you can see there's a whole list of object snap if I press the uh, left mouse button. But if I tap the right mouse button, it pulls off a toolbar. And this toolbar you can uh, keep around, you can dock onto uh, the side of the screen. I'm going to use that toolbar again. So I'm going to just put it up here uh, where I can get to it. And most of the time, the O-snaps are what we call running. We just have them going so they're ready to pick an endpoint or pick an insertion point or a center point, so on. So I've got a lot of O-snaps over here. I can turn a few off so I can add them back in as we need them, but typically endpoint, midpoint, intersection, probably center are the O-snaps that I have on, and that's right under uh, the sidebar. When you start a command like polyline here, you'll notice that the sidebar gets traded out for the command line or command bar, if you want to call it, in Windows. And if I hit escape, it exits the command. If I hit circle, again, it trades it out for the command line. And if I take circle and I pick a center point, I can be anywhere over here and type in 10 or you know, or one for that uh, for that circle radius. Okay, so once it's focused on that, I just have to type it in and then enter. I think it's real common when we start out with Rhino for Mac, we keep going back here, and there are times to go back there. But if it's ready for input, all you have to do is type, and that goes in that input field. Um, when you take a command, there are options over here like for polyline persist and close. I don't want that on, but you'll notice that commands like polyline and circle, they have options over here. So there are reasons to go back there. And then you can see uh, your last few commands. If you pick down here in the lower left, you can see um, the last command you ran on the command line down here across the bottom. You also get input about where the cursor is on the status bar and what construction plane you're using. And then off to the right are the inspector panels. And the inspector panels, there are two of them. And I've 
had to um, go over these with customers on tech support. It's something new in Rhino 7, um, the way they're organized. They're not new. I mean, they were in previous versions, but the way they're organized here is a little bit different in uh, Rhino 7. And if you look up here, there are actually two categories of panels, properties panel, and then our inspector uh, panels. So our uh, inspector panels right now are showing all these additional panels that we can open up like uh, layers and notes and display. So those are really helpful. But watch what happens if I pick on show property panel. Then my property panel, which was down here, I have two of them. Okay, and if I pick on a detail, for example, it shows up with information about that detail. I don't need two of them. So if I go down here and pick on show inspector panels, well, now I have my property panel at the top and my inspector panels at the bottom. And if I wanted to switch them, then I would go back to inspector panels up here. Again, I don't usually need two of them, although I do like three of them. And you can turn three on if you have enough space, and that would be done from themes. So if you have enough um, space on your monitor. I think it's it's really helpful to have three, especially when we're here in the detail area because there's global layers and there's also layer control in that detail. And having both of those I think is great with three inspector panels. But uh, I'm going to use that, leave that at two for now. Oh, how we got the floating menu. Sure. Um, I use the right mouse button. And when you right click over a toolbar that has a little arrow pointing down, it opens up the toolbar. So any of these I can right click over and keep those toolbars open. And when it comes to the OSNAP toolbar, um, it's a little bit easier just having it ready to go pick. Oh, you are welcome. You are welcome. The other option you have there is to hold the cursor down and just go through here like if I wanted midpoint, but then when I pick it, it goes away. So any of these that have the little down arrow, you can open up that toolbar and find a place uh, for it uh, on, on the screen here or on another screen. Like I have two monitors, so I can scoot that guy over here. You can't see it, but if I bring it back to the screen that I'm sharing, you can see it. So it's really, really helpful to have toolbars that you use a lot open. And that's kind of what this is doing up here. So it's giving you a way to get to the toolbars. They're kind of stacked on each other, but it really helps save that valuable real estate that uh, is your Rhino screen. So um, the other thing I want to show you is only Mac, and that's this little button here, and it will compress the sidebar, either the right or the left sidebar, so you can have more room on the screen. So if I was doing a presentation, um, maybe I wanted to show my client this, I might not want all of that on the screen. So by compressing the sidebar, we, uh, uh, we get more of a clean screen approach. And that's one of the features that I really like in Rhino for Mac that we don't have in Rhino for Windows. So I'll be pointing out a few of them and that uh, that's it. That really is a great way to bring back your screen. It may also be something that you hadn't identified and all of a sudden you're looking at Rhino and you're like, where the heck is my sidebar? You know, so hopefully you'll think back to this and go, oh yeah, just pick on that and, and uh, we're back. Okay, so I don't want to have this file um, open. So what I have to do in Rhino for Mac is I have to close it. So um, one of the things that Mac will let you do is open up multiple documents. So if I go up here to file and use a template, then it will bring up a list of templates and I can uh, pick on, let's say small objects millimeters. I'll open up, that's my default template too. I can open up a new model. But um, Rhino still has, I ended up uh, using a computer that has a, a lot on the desktop, so I'll try to spare you from having to see my desktop. But uh, anyway, um, I have now two models open and I can go back and forth between the two of them. I can also pick on something 
let's say, this wall. And if I command C to copy it, then I can bring it back here and paste it. And I'll just zoom extents in all viewports. Now you can see it's in that model. Okay. So anyway, just a little bit of clipboard uh, action. But I can close this model down. I don't have to keep it to open. I don't think I did anything to save it, so I'll just close it and revert back to uh, the way it was when, uh, when I opened it. OK, so I don't really want to do a whole lot with, uh, with this uh, file. Um, let's see. Um, up here, we have uh, Zoom Extents and Zoom Extents All Viewports. Um, since I don't have anything in the viewport, I may just pick this button, which is four viewports, and it will kind of reset the viewport where it was before I started doing the zooming. Not necessary, but I just thought we'd point that out. Also, when we pasted that geometry, the layer that it was on also came with it. So we'll be uh, seeing more about layers as we work today. But I want to talk a little bit more about the inspector panel. One thing I pointed out about the help panel is when you're um, inputting a command in Rhino, uh, let's say it's just the polyline command. Um, when I take the polyline command and I go to the help panel, it tells me about the polyline, it gives me a video and you know it goes through how to use that command. So this is what I was talking about. If you combine that um, um, file that we showed, commands to know in Rhino, um, you can type in a command and then you can look at what the help says about that command. Or if you're watching a, a tutorial, like one of Kyle's tutorials, and you type in loft and you don't know about the loft command, this will tell you not only about it and show a video how to use it, but it tells you where the command is located. And when I teach a Rhino class the first day, I'll tell people where commands are. And after that, uh, I'll have them either help each other find them or have them use the help because all the information is in the help. The loft command is on the surface creation toolbar. So if I go up here to surface, I'll find the loft command. If I go over to uh, surface, I have to be out of the, if I go over to surface tools, I can find the loft command right there on the toolbar. So this picture, picture is worth a thousand words. That's going to help you find that uh, command. So if I go up here to surface and take two rail sweep, but I don't know what it looks like on the toolbar, I can see what that icon looks like. And now I can come over here and I can hone in on it. That's the two rail sweep. I mean, eventually I'm gonna find it, especially if I go slow enough, but um, this will help you identify what that button looks like. So um, that is uh, a really uh, good way to, uh, to use the help. Also one of the features that we're going to look at in Rhino is called history. And one thing we're going to have to um, know about history is what commands support it. So if I type in history, the help will come up with that uh, information. Another panel that I want to have you open here is very good when you're learning Rhino. It's called tutorials. So in the inspector panel, you know, where your layer and notes and display and help are, pick the gear and come down to tutorials. How did we get to the help panel? Um, it's over on the right. It should be open. At least layers should be open. It was open at one time. Now, whether it got closed or not, I don't know that. But if you pick the down arrow, you can open it uh, up again with command help right there. Okay, great. So you might have been working on Rhino and thought, I oh, that help, that's not helpful, and it turned it off, but just turn it back on again. And um, that's the same way that you open up tutorials. Now, tutorials has the little mortar cap 
And after this class, if you haven't found the user guide, there's more tutorials to do. And the advantage of using the user guide is that there is a Mac version. So you can double click on it, it downloads it. If I drag over my Adobe Acrobat, you can see it opens it up. So I can go through the user guide about the interface and about um, navigating and, and all the important details that you need to know when you're learning Rhino step by step. And the models that this tutorial uh, the user guide needs are right here. So if I go to open up the model trim curves, I double click on it, it opens it up. So you can see there's a direct link between the tutorials, the PDF location, and the files. So that's homework after the class. Go through the user guide. So it's, it's wonderful because we have a Mac version of it. Now, when you get done with the user guide, um, you can take a look at the level one um, and the level two, but level one first. Um, the level one uh, training guide is here. And most things that say uh, six work in seven. Now, I think that's been changed with the latest version. We got rid of the six. It does work in six or later. So uh, anyway, don't let that uh, distract you. But the one thing you're gonna notice is we only have one uh, training guide. The interface hasn't been translated into the Mac, but I like to compare or liken doing a Windows video to doing a video in another language. So as soon as you know Rhino for Mac, you're gonna be able to do a tutorial that was done in Rhino for Windows. You're gonna know where things are on the screen. And just like you found, let's say, a really great tutorial that was done in Spanish. Okay, so you're using the English version of Rhino. You've gotta translate between what the instructor is saying in Spanish to English, right? Same thing for the Mac. You're going to translate what the instructor is saying about Windows Rhino into the Mac. And eventually, you just do it without uh, thinking. So don't get uh, too turned off by a Windows video, especially when you get experience in your Rhino for Mac. If you do these beginning tutorials, eventually when you hear the instructor say, go down and turn on Smart Track, you're going to know that on Rhino for Mac, you're going to go up. Okay, or if the instructor says, hit the control key, you're gonna know you need the command key. So there's some very basic things that you need to know to make that tutorial helpful and doable in Rhino for Mac. But if you start with this, maybe look at the ones that were already done in Rhino for Mac so you know directly where things are, then take a look at the level one training guide. I am absolutely sure you can do it. Now, if you're a teacher, I always tell them to do the user guide interface. So do the UI with the user guide and then switch over to the training guide for some additional videos. And it actually works really well. Uh, someday, you know, it's on the list to have a level one training guide for the Mac, but we just need uh, a little bit more uh, time and focus. And this year was a Rhino 7 shipped and it's been all hands on deck as far as tech support. So things uh, do get uh, put on the back burner, let's say. Okay, so I want you to know where that is. So what I'd like you to do is go down to the user guide and, oh, no, nope, I'd like you to go up, there we go, to the level one training guide and scroll down to a file called um, Let's see if I can find it here, called Rhino. Up, 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 up. up. That's very, very odd. I'm looking for one called What is Rhino? But it's okay, we can, we can definitely use another one. Um, and either I'm overlooking it, which I do from time to time. There it is, I did, I didn't go down far enough or I went down too far, I'm not really quite sure, but there it is. Um, off the level one panel, what is Rhino? Go ahead and double click on it 
and open up what is Rhino. Okay, this is uh, not in Rhino 7, so Rhino, uh, it was a Rhino 6 file, will tell me that it's not going to autosave, so it doesn't overwrite the file by, uh, by mistake. So in the what is Rhino file, it gives you a really good idea, all the geometries that Rhino will create from curves to surfaces to dimensions to text. These are not all of them. There are lights, there are sub D objects now, but it gives you a really good idea about what's already there. And the um, some of the modeling aids that we want to take a look at here. Watch what happens here. I'm in the perspective view, but I can really quickly go to the top parallel view just by picking or the front, which isn't going to show you much right now, but um, you can switch back and forth between top and perspective here. Otherwise, you double click and then you go back to the one you want to be in. But um, I wanted you to uh, do a little bit of review here on a command that we're going to use a lot in our project. It's the gumball. And if you notice when I pick on curves in Rhino 7, it automatically has the uh, control points turned on. So you can modify the curve using the control point grid. Okay, and that can be turned off, but I'm going to encourage you to keep it turned on because it is super useful for modifying curves directly, okay? But what if I pick on the curve and I want to copy it, rotate it, move it? I do have those commands, but what if I didn't, I want an easier way. I want to just go directly to the object and move, copy, scale, or rotate it. And that's where Gumball comes in. So if you come up here to your modeling aids, I'll scoot that up a little bit. If you come up to your modeling aids and you turn on the gumball, you're going to notice when you pick on objects, it's going to have a, a widget that has three arrows on it. But if I pick here in 2D, I'm only going to see two. And I can use that widget to move the curve. And if I'm moving it and I tap the option or alt key, I get a plus and that's actually copy. So if I drag it here and I tap, tap is kind of a quick hit it and let go by the way. So if I tap the all key, I get a, while I'm moving, it will switch from move mode into copy mode, okay? So what else can I do with the gumball? Well, it has a rotate arc. Oh, one other thing we can do is I can Command C, Command V. So now I have two curves right on top of each other. I can take one and I can move it 10 units to the right. Okay, so if you're wondering how you can use the gumball to create a copy an exact distance away, that's a really easy way to do it. Now, once you have these curves, you can rotate them and you can rotate them visually, or you can type in minus 45, so that arc will let you rotate either um, visually or type in a, an angle. You can also scale in one direction by pulling the scale widget, or you can hold the shift key down and scale uniformly in both directions. You can also type in, like if I wanted this to be 0.5, scaled at 0.5, then it will scale it in by 0.5, and let's say I want that too, okay? If I go back to the perspective view, there's also a, an option here where you can use this little sphere to extrude your curve into a surface, okay? So any of these can be extruded into a surface using the gumball, okay? We also have a command called close curve. So if I type in close curve, it auto completes. And 
If I extrude with the gumball, I get an opening at the top and the bottom. And I can use a command called cap to close it. And it will cap it at the top and the bottom. Let me undo that. Um, and I'll undo again. I could also go up to solid and use extrude planar curve straight. So it's planar and it's closed. That's the criteria that that has to meet. And that creates a closed extrusion, which is a very efficient form of a polysurface from that object. A couple other commands that you can do here um, off, off a solid, you can do pipe. And you can pick on this curve and you can pick the starting radius as one, let's say the ending radius as two, and create a pipe through that geometry. Now, the curve is still there, and if you come up here and put your viewport in ghosted mode, you can probably see, and some colors are better than others, that the curves are still there. So you have ghosted mode. You also have x-ray mode to help you see through the objects without the back face um, being um, a little more muted, like uh, ghosted. And you can work here in ghosted mode. So if I extrude that up, you can see we're coming up with some type of model. OK, when I have a solid that's closed, I can get volume from it. So a lot of times we're looking for closed, not uh, closed, uh, or I should say not open surfaces, but uh, closed poly surfaces. And cap is one way uh, to do that. Another way is to use a command off a surface called offset surface. And I can make it a solid and offset it in this case to the outside, but I could also flip it to the inside, and now I have a solid, okay? And does anybody want to tell me when having a solid is important? Okay, what process do we do after modeling where having solid geometry is imperative? Do any of you have 3D printers? Okay, so you can't turn this into a valid STL unless it's uh, closed because your 3D printer relies on volume. So knowing uh, ways to not only create closed geometry, but if it's not closed, make it closed will be really important if you're using a 3D printer. Another command, this will be the last one, and then we're going to go on to our project, is called Shell. And I can turn this into a shelled version of this solid. If I were going to 3D print it, I can pr pick on the top, and there we go. It's solid on the top and the bottom. Now, we have an Ultimaker, which is uh, on loan from Ultimaker, an Ultimaker 3 extended. And it has uh, two, um, two materials on it. So I can put a support material, and I can put uh, the PLA material um, on the other spindle. So I can have um, a material that will essentially dissolve in water, and then I can have my plastic material. So that's an awesome machine that I could send any of the, these closed geometries out to. And I could send all of these at the same time. I don't have to have one closed geometry as long as they're all closed they can go out. OK, uh, let's look at what homework is. And I had you download uh, a file. Um, and here's my July getting started. And in this folder, I have a file called surfaces.3dm. And again, um, if you open a file from previous Rhino, it's going to disable the autosave for that file. So if I go back to perspective, what I want you to do with um, each of these is look up the command. So make the help active and type in like edge surf. And that will bring up help on uh, edge surf. So you can watch 
uh, creating the surface. So with the edge surf command, I could create a surface out of up to four curves. So as soon as I select four, it does that surface. Okay. So if I type in sweep or I know where it's located, I may not know where it's located though. So using the help is, is going to get you there as well. It's going to tell you what it looks like again, where it's located. I think we went over that one. Pick the two rails. This time I'm going to turn on something called history. And history will create a relationship between the input curves and the output curves. So when I pick the cross section curves here and then I enter, I'll get some options for the sweep, and if, we're, if it were adjacent to a surface, I would have continuity options, which can be really important if you're trying to fill in um, a surface that may be missing and you want it to be, uh, to have some continuity with the adjacent surface. I'm going to pick sweep. So there's a relationship now between the curve, the input curves and the output geometry. And if I put this in, uh, X-ray mode, I'll be able to see my control points. So if I start moving them, take a look at what happens. And this is designing in 3D, right? So I'm not just, uh, you know, have to, have to undo and go back. I can uh, design my geometry in 3D using history. Now history is the relationship between the input curves and the output curves, right? So I can break history if I go to change this object. Okay, so if I go to scale it, let's say I'm gonna cancel because I'll break history. Okay, it's a one-way street. The curves drive the output, the output does not drive the curves. Okay, so, and you can get that um, if you look up history, in the help file again. So that's your homework. Go through each of those surfaces, play around with them, maybe combine them with history, and uh, take a look. Keep referencing that help. It's, it's very valuable. So I'm going to close this file down and revert. And I have another option I can do with this one. If I wanted to save this, I can go up to File and hold down my option key and watch what happens. When I hold down my option key, I get close all and I get save as. So if I want to save this as a different name, duplicate is kind of odd, especially if you've used a save as command in the Windows environment. So I'm gonna hold, hold down the alt key and pick save as and that way I can save this and I'll call it um, all Rhino and that will go in the folder that uh, I'm working in, okay? So all Rhino, I'll go ahead and close that down and I'm in an untitled file. Uh, let's go up to open. And in the zip file, files for today's class, you're going to find a file called, um, It's probably, here it is, my shed start. Okay, so it's, I haven't edited it yet and I've got it prioritized here by the ones I've edited or have open. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up my shed start. Now this is a little more than a shed. Uh, it's actually a um, um, outbuilding. It's a smaller you know, building that we're going to um, have on, you know, imagine that we'll have on some property. Um, it's designed to have six inch exterior walls, have electricity, have plumbing, have insulation. It's going to be made out of standard building materials um, and standard uh, stud construction. So it's a little more than a shed, but we can uh, minimize it a little bit as we get started. Again, it's a guest house or a studio building um, that is a permanent structure. So Let's go over here to layers. And if you download the PDF, you can uh, remind yourself again, kind of what the building looks like. Okay, so that's what we're aiming for. And um, the PDF that came out of that zip file also has 
the dimensions on it. So let's uh, get started. First of all, um, I'm going to create the base geometry and I will create the curves first. I'm gonna make the curve layer current. Notice that I not only have layers over here, but I have sub layers and that way I can keep my geometry organized. By opening this model, there are a couple things in here that I'm going to have ready for you to use just um, in the consideration of time. But it also has some points so that when we get done, our, our buildings are essentially in the same place on all the models. So um, when I go to create the um, platform for uh, the, the, the concrete slab, I want it to be on the base curves layer and I'll start with a polyline. And when I start with the polyline, I want to be able to snap to that point. So I'm going to turn on my point O snap and I'll now be able to snap to that point. And as I'm moving the cursor around, I have no idea how far I'm going. I'm also not locked on to horizontal or vertical. So let's take a look at uh, that. If I come up here and turn ortho on, I'll lock my cursor into horizontal or vertical. I'm just going to create a couple test curves here and we'll probably, we'll delete this eventually. So that's great, but what if I need to draw a segment at 45 degrees or 60 degrees? I can't do that when I'm locked on to 90. So what I want to, to do is to go up to Rhino 7 and down to Preferences. And there's two controls that you want to know about in Rhino for Mac. Preferences will control your settings for this for this Rhino, for this computer. So everything I do here under Rhino Preferences will be saved with Rhino. And every model I open will use them. Okay, so that's preferences. So if I go here to modeling aids and I look at what ortho is set to, it's set to 90. And I'm going to set that to 15, okay? So every time um, we move our cursor around, we're going to see that 15 degree angle. So um, let's go ahead and set that to 15. Again, I can show all for you. Preferences is under Rhino 7 and then down to modeling aids and <laughs> modeling aids and set the snap to 15. Okay, very, very helpful. And I can show all to go back, I can close that down. Okay, so let's see what we can do now. So if I grab polyline, I can drag my cursor around and I, with ortho, I can snap at any increment here of 15 degrees, but I don't really know whether I'm snapping to 30 or 15 or 45. I can kind of figure it out, but I want Rhino to tell me what the angle is I'm snapping to. Okay, so let's go back. Rhino 7, preferences and modeling aids. Across the top here, there's something called cursor tooltips and I want to turn on distance and relative point angle. Okay, let's see what that does. This is going to be much more helpful because I'm not only going to see the angle, but I'm going to see the relative distance I'm traveling from that point. Okay, so um, let's uh, go ahead and show all, and then we'll close that. Okay, let's look at the difference. If I take polyline now, you can see the distance we are traveling and you can see the angle. So if I type in 100, then it's going 100 units in that direction. Now if I wanna type in 100 on 45, it's going 100 units as soon as I pick. Now if I change my mind at the end, I really wanna go 30, all I have to do is pick. Okay, so this is called distance constraining. It works really well with uh, tool tips. And then I can type in the distance that I want to go. I can undo the last two. There we go as well. 
Okay, so that is a little practice. One other uh, tool uh, modeling aid that Rhino has is the Snap Grid, and it's under File and Settings, and it's under Grid. So right now my grid extents is 200, and I'm snapping at 0.25 inch. That's way too small. And also, with minor grid lines every 12, I want them every six. Okay, so um, I'm going to see those grid lines every six inches. And I also want to snap maybe every six. Okay, so now when I um, close that down, you notice that when I snap, I'll turn snap grid on, I'm snapping to each of those grid dots and those grid dots are spaced at six inches. Okay, so you got you need to pick what's going to be helpful for your model. Okay. And six is fine if you're going to be doing detailed work, then you can have it snap as one. The last thing that I want to show you here is uh, up under file and settings. And if you do imperial units, you, you will appreciate this. Under units, there's an option to show feet and inches. So if I turn feet and inches on, and then I close that down, when I start drawing my polyline, and I think I'm going to reopen this file because I, let me see if I undo. Yeah, I, I don't have to reopen it. I just need to be a little more careful when I'm deleting and not delete the points that I need. There we go. Okay, so if I pick polyline and I pick here at that point, notice my cursor is updating in feet and inches. Okay, and that's really helpful. Okay, so I can type in, if all I know is 180, let's say 144 inches, I can type that in. Okay, but if I put in 16 feet, which is what my drawing says with the foot mark, then Rhino will input that curve with um, 16 feet, not 16 inches, which is what I would have got if I didn't put anything in. Then I'm going to put in 20 feet, enter, and pick. Don't forget that. 16 feet, enter, and pick. And then we'll close that back to the beginning point. So that will be our concrete pad. That's the size and the location that uh, that we need. Um, and then um, let's go ahead and make the base layer current. And we'll take this up under solid, extrude planar curve straight. Okay, I'm going to extrude it. You could see what's happening here in the front and the right view. I need to extrude it six units below the construction plane. Okay, so I'll type in six, and when I do that, I just pick to let Rhino know that's what I want. Okay, so again, I'm going to use the menu just to make it efficient, but if you want to find out where these commands are located, go to your uh, help inspector and it will help you with that. Okay, so I extruded. I now have not only my curve, but I have my base. Um, let's take a look at doing the actual uh, wall layout. So I will make the exterior wall curves layer current, and I can start out with polyline at this point, which is located, if I look at my plan, eight feet from the corner. Okay, so one thing I could do if um, if I wanted to measure from, uh, from that point, I could do a long line or I could do uh, from. So if I took polyline and I typed in from, and that is uh, an O snap, I want it to be located from, so I can pick on this point and I can go eight feet, don't forget the foot mark, and I'd be right at, uh, right at that point as soon as I picked. So if I didn't have the point there for you from is an O snap that uh, you can use to locate yourself relative to an existing location. And if I go over here to help and I type in from, 
it's not um, it's not a command, so it doesn't look like it is finding it. That's uh, a little bit strange. I'd have have to probably go up here to Rhino Help and type in the uh, from. There we go. Finally, okay. From there we go. Search results. Well, that is not what I was expecting. Something for me to check on. It looks like maybe from is not searchable. It might be in the help, but it's not uh, coming uh, coming up. When you uh, put your cursor over most of these um, O snaps, they will. Uh, most of them are persistent. Okay, but there are uh, some like from here I could pick from and then between that we're going to use that are not persistent that we might uh, want to make sure that toolbar is open to take them from. But anyway, I'll make sure that is in the help file if it seems like it's not there, but I haven't done a, a thorough search. Okay, so that's uh, from here and we're going to go over 16 feet. And then we're going to go back 12 feet. If I were to do this again, I would make the porch smaller. So I'm not going to redesign it on the fly here. But if you are doing this again, I would maybe maybe go with six feet for the porch and then give a couple more feet for the interior. Okay, so I want to extrude this line um, into the walls, but if I extrude it right now, it's going to be a solid kind of chunk of material. I will really benefit if I offset this curve first and then extrude. So I'll go to offset curve and I'm going to offset at six. So I type in six and I'll pick out in the open. Okay, so now that I have both of these, I will go to the layers and make the exterior wall layer current. And up under solid, I could extrude planar curve straight. Um, we also looked at using the gumball. And since I'm going to be trimming off these walls, I can actually just extrude using the gumball. Okay, so either way, you can extrude from surface solid or you can extrude using the gumball. Um, there is a line that I have setting the slope of the roof and we'll also use that line for the roof. But for right now, I'm going to use that to trim. And trim, you can type it in, you can pick it off the toolbar. It's also under edit. I'm just going to pick it right here off the toolbar. And when it says select trimming object, the cutting object is that curve. Okay, I'll enter. Okay, enter is important because it gets you to the next part of the command. And I'm going to trim off those inside and outside walls. So now I have the exterior starting to take shape. At least I have the walls, but what I'd like to do with this object is turn it into a solid, because at some point I would like to, um, at some point I'd like to 3D print it. So I'll pick it and I'll pick it again. And up under solid, there's a command called cap planar holes. Okay. And the planar opening, let me undo that. There's one thing I don't know about this that I'm going to have to take a look at. So let me turn off the base layer. And if you notice, it's open at the bottom and the top. So one thing I need to do is create a surface out of these curves. So up under surface from planar curves, it creates a surface and I'm going to join that surface to that, to the wall. Okay, and then I'll join the interior surface. Okay, now those are all joined together. Okay, similar 
to what we did before. Now, if I used extrude from the solid menu, I wouldn't have had to do that. So that was one of the consequences of using the extrude from, uh, from the um, gumball. And the only time this is important is if you really have to have a closed solid. And I'm still thinking in my head that I'm going to be sending this out to my Ultimaker. So I'm going to proceed with those type of restrictions. Okay, and all I had to do for this one now is cap planar hole. And if you look at it here on the right, it is a closed solid. Okay, so a little bit extra work that I wasn't planning on. Again, this is Rhino Live. So event, uh, sometimes we go down a dark alley and do something that has a consequence and, and we can see that with that gumball extrude. Okay, let's do the roof. And this line is also going to help us do the roof. So I need to mirror it, and I'll take mirror with the midpoint O snap. If you don't have midpoint on, get it on. Pick at the midpoint of the wall or the curve. Either one works, and um, that mirrors that line to the other side. Now I need to quickly create a surface between those two lines. So I'm going to make the framing layer current, and up under surface and loft, I'm going to loft between those two curves, okay? Loft, that gives me the surface that I need to create the ceiling or the framing, the roof framing, okay? And I'm going to show it all finished with the fascia on it, so I'm not gonna be showing each of the um, uh, trusses that we would have in there. I'm just going to extrude it as if it were finished uh, exterior up under solid, and down to extrude surface. I'm going to extrude it straight, but I don't wanna go normal to that curve. I don't like that look. So I wanna go over here to direction and I'm going to pick at the end of that surface and using ortho, which is still on, I'm going to drag my cursor vertical and pick. And when I do that, you can see that the extrude starts to happen in the direction that I was looking for, which is perpendicular to the construction plane. And I'm going to type in 10, and that will be the depth of the ceiling. Okay, it's not spanning a very um, large space, so I can get away with that. And the next thing we need to do is extract the top surface so I have a layer that I can show the roofing. So up under solid, extract surface. Notice over here, I need a check mark and copy and I want to extract the surface. Now I have both. I have the uh, ceiling or, or the roof framing and I have a separate surface that is going to go onto the, the roofing layer. So over here, I can put it on the roofing layer. I can also right click on roofing and pick change object layer and the selected object will go to that layer. Okay, let's right click and go to solid extrude planar curve straight. Again, the direction is an issue. I need to uh, pick on direction and pick the vertical direction of the construction plane and put in a roof material thickness of two. Two and enter will get you the roof. Okay, so that's looking uh, pretty good. Um, I do need to do a little bit of work here with uh, setting out the curves for the windows and uh, the door, so that will uh, that will be next, and then we'll work on the front, um, the overhang for the front, and the framing for that uh, overhang. So, um, if you haven't saved yet, you might want to. You can save over this file, or you can hold down the Option key again and save as, and you can name it something that is significant, like guest house in class is what I'll name this one. And that way I can go back, and if I did decide to rework the floor plan, I can go back and I have that model ready to work on again. So let's go to door, 
and I need a curve layer. So I'm going to right click on door and come down to make sub layer. Now I don't want to make a layer because then it will be on the same level as door and I would have to drag it, but I'm going to make a sub layer called curve. And that way I can create my door curves on a separate layer that I'll be, I will be creating geometry. Now if I pick on this layer and I don't want it to be a sub layer, I can pick it up and I can drag it out so it becomes its own layer. But if I want it to be under door again, I'll pick it and drop it under door. Okay, so you can rearrange these layers. They are not in alphanumeric and Rhino will do a really good job of trying to remember that. Okay, let's start with the door and I'm going to pick in this corner with the rectangle. And once uh, I get that started, I'm going to reference the front view. And in the front view, I'll type in the width of 36 and the height of the door as 80, okay? Now, according to my plan, that's not where I want the door. So I want to pick on that curve and I want to move it over two foot eight. So I'll type in two foot eight and there we go over to that location. When I do the window, I want it to be the same height as the door opening, but um, I want it to be four foot six, the corner of the window, four foot six from the opening. So I can go up here and pick on from, and I can pick on that corner, and I can locate it four foot six from that corner and pick. Okay, and then I'm ready to do minus, actually in this case, I need the positive 48. There we go, and then minus 48 for that window. There are a zillion ways to do this window. That's just one with the from. If I wanted to, I could just make the window here, put in 48, put in minus 48, and remember what we did with the door? We just picked on it, and we used gumball to move it over. Uh, we moved it over two foot eight, but we actually need to move this one over four foot six. Here we go. That's a great way to work. And there's one more feature that I don't want to spend, uh, it, it takes a while to get used to, but I just want to introduce you to it and it's something you can do for homework. It's called Smart Track. And with Smart Track, I can guide my cursor over that point and drag my cursor away and then just type in four foot six. Okay. Sometimes it kind of goes back and snaps on the wrong part. Let me see if I can try that again. Again, it's a little bit to get uh, used to. And obviously here I have some O snaps that are taking uh, taking this back to where I don't want to go, four foot six. No, no, it's not. See, it's kind of funky sometimes. So anyway, I think those other two uh, ways are better. I'll bring my window back and we'll save Smart Track for another time. Um, so I have the curves and the curves are going to be used to cut through the uh, geometry. Um, I actually need another window, but I'll do I'll do the other window on this elevation later. But let's take this one and mirror it. And this is a really quick way to get a copy of something at 45 degrees is to mirror it so I can mirror that to the other side. I also want another one of these uh, windows. So uh, I will... Um, Command C to copy, Command V to paste, and I want to move this one, uh, let's say five foot. And if, it, if that's uh, too close, then we'll uh, put something else in, five foot. Okay, that's not bad, but I may wanna go five foot six. Let me, that's better. Okay, so what are we gonna do with this? Well, I'm going to take the uh, curve that we use to create the roof from, and I'm going to, notice how it's snapping. You can hit F9 or you can come up here and turn snap uh, off. 
snap is getting a little bit in the way here because I want to work with the right view. I also want to point out something that I have set where I link the viewports, which you may not have yet. So if you like the way the viewports are linked, you can link them. And that is up under preferences. And if you come down to view, there's an option called linked viewports right here. So you can try that and see if you like it. I do most of the time, sometimes I turn it off if I have a really large model going like a, a civil model. So I'm going to copy this using the gumball, tap the option key. And I'm going to use that as a reference curve and create a window that follows the same slope as the roof, okay? So that's pretty good. I mean, I could snap to that curve using near or perpendicular, but I think we've done really good there. Um, let's take this curve, and I want to create another curve across the front of the building and maybe use perpendicular or intersection. This is where I want the height of the window to be at this elevation. So I want a nice continuous um, curve here that defines where the height of these windows is. Okay. So let's do the front window now and then we'll start slicing uh, and dicing here. Um, I want to do the rectangle, but I want the center rectangle. And I'll pick in the center here, the midpoint of this curve. The window will be 12 units long. Oh, and I don't want 12, look at that. I want 12 feet, so let's do that again. Okay, so I had already entered 12, and that would be, that would be fine if I were modeling in feet, but I'm modeling in inches. So I need to put in 12 feet, enter, and then 24 inches or two feet. Okay, so this was a little strange, but I think it will still work. When I repeated the rectangle, I didn't do the center one. So I'm going to move it from the midpoint down to here, which was where I wanted it. But nevertheless, the worst thing about it was it just was in the wrong place, but we can solve that pretty easy with a move. And if I would have paid more attention when I repeated, I could have made it uh, so that I didn't have to move it. But all of that looks uh, really good. Let's go ahead and start cutting the holes into our uh, wall. And the wall, let me point out again, is a closed poly surface. In order for the next command to work, you have to have a closed poly surface. And if this part doesn't work, you may want to um, just redo the uh, redo it later with the video um, because this is going to depend on that being a closed solid. Okay, so I've got my curves. They are closed and planar. The geometry that I'm going to cut is a solid. So, uh, and it is also planar. So let's put a command to use here that's fantastic called wire cut, although it does have quite a few uh, restrictions. So I couldn't have a um, curve that wasn't planar that had you know, bends um, in it. So um, it kind of undulates around. I couldn't use that. So if I had a freeform curve and this wasn't just a flat window, I wouldn't be able to use this command. There'd be other commands I'd have to use, but nothing quite as auto magic as this one. I'd have a lot more surfacing work to do. So wire cut, I'm going to, in the front view, pick on the wall, okay, and then enter. And then I'm going to drag my cursor here normal to the curve. Now watch what happens. I think it's really fun to watch it here on the perspective view. When I drag this back, notice it says normal to curve. If yours doesn't say normal to curve, make it say it. And then pick and over model here because what we're doing is selecting that geometry. It will be deleted as soon as I enter. Okay, so um, I didn't want to go back that far, so I'll do it again. Uh, wire cut. And we're going to bring these curves back only to clip the front elevation. There we go. And then enter. The 
Let me uh, get wire cut rolling again. Okay, pick the curves. Okay, pick the object to wire cut. Enter. Pick and then enter. Great. Okay, I got what I wanted. Just that uh, that part. We do want an opening on the back, but what we need is the curve. And to do the curve, we will mirror it. And then we'll do a little bit of trim. And then we'll do the front of, uh, of the uh, building. So things are moving along. We'll be, uh, we've got another about 40 minutes to get all of this uh, going. Uh, I'm going to bring this down. And again, I'm going to line it up with that, uh, where that line is intersecting the back elevation. And we'll do a wire cut again. Just for aesthetics, you can also place it where uh, you think uh, it looks good. I'll pick on the poly surface again. I'll drag it to the inside, enter, and it's gone. Okay, so we have our window to bring some light into the uh, main area as well as the shower room. Okay, last thing, let's take these curves. This is, um, I do want them on the other side because I need them when uh, I do the trim. So I can do a mirror, but I can also wire cut them at the same time. So um, here in the right view, under solid, edit tools, wire cut. Okay, pick the object to wire cut, and then we're gonna bring it all the way back. Great, so we did both of those at the same time. We have the curves to do the framing and I will uh, go through creating um, a window and a door and I'll do most of them, but it gets a little bit te tedious, maybe a little boring for you if I do all of them. But I, I think also seeing the repetition can, uh, can be helpful. So if you haven't saved in a while, go ahead and do that. Although Mac actually yells at me and brings up dialog boxes if I save too much. So I'm not going to uh, save. It actually is kind of auto saving in the background. So, okay, let's do the trim for uh, the window. Let's start with that. So I have my curve on the front elevation. I want to make the um, curve that we'll use to build the trim from, actually two curves. So take a look at this. If we go up to curve and down to offset curve, I can offset it equally on both sides, but I do have to come over each time and pick that. Now that's a pretty thick uh, trim, so I'm going to put in 1.5. So and that may be, that's probably pretty good um, for, uh, for the trim. You might also want to look at two to see if you uh, like uh, that. So offset curve, both sides. Whatever I start using, I'm going to use everywhere. So I like 1.5, so I'll put in 1.5. Both sides, make sure you get that picked and then pick again. Okay, let's look at the uh, top view. The curve that I use to offset, I'm going to slide back and I'm going to use it to create the glass. So I slide it back here and then I go up to the clear glass layer and up under surface, I'll create surface from planar curve, okay? So we have our glass. I'll go ahead and unselect it. I'll pick on the curves that I'm going to be using for the trim. I'll make the trim layer current <clears throat> and I'll move them one unit out, okay? So I want the curve to extend out um, one inch beyond the exterior wall. And then we will solid extrude planar curve straight and we'll put in a distance of eight. And that creates trim both on the inside and the outside. And that is our window, okay? So if we highlight the window and turn it into a block, 
when we start copying it around, then it will um, have the block association and we will be able to count it. So I'll put in 48 by 48. This is actually a fixed window. I didn't put in a way to open it, which is probably kind of dumb for my design. But anyway, nevertheless, um, I will go ahead with this um, for this version of it. OK, well, now when I begin copying it, I'll be able to ask Rhino in the block manager how many of these windows we have. And in a small building like this, yeah, we can see how many we have. But in a larger building, you can ask Rhino for that information. So I'll show you that here in a little bit. Up under Transform and Mirror, I'm going to mirror that to the other side of the wall. And then I'm going to. Now, the other thing, mirror it again, the other thing about having a block, if I do decide to make these windows operable or add some type of mullions to them, then by editing the block, all the windows are going to update. So that is very powerful. And watch what happens if I go up here under edit and down to block and down to block manager. I can actually pick it to, from over uh, from over here, right there, um, block managers in that toolbar. But um, here it tells me I have three instances. So now I know I have three of those windows in this file. Okay, let's go, uh, go ahead and work on the door. It's a little bit uh, different. I do need the door uh, curve so I can create the actual door. So I'm going to use the gumball, tap the option key. So now I have a curve on the inside and the outside. So um, as far as the door goes, that would be a pretty boring door if it's just a solid door. So what I want to do is offset the curve. And I'm going to offset it on the inside by 6. Okay, So I'm going to have a, a relight. Uh, I might put a relight on the side, but I'm actually going to have a window in the door, so it's going to let light uh, in. Um, now that I have both of these curves, and I want to make sure and get the one on the inside here, now that I have both of these curves, I'm going to extrude it into a door. So I'll make sure and get the door layer current, and up under solid, extrude planar curve straight. I want it to be equally on each side of those curves. Um, for the distance, I'll type in 1.25, and then I will pick. So now I have a solid door. And if I hold the Control key down, actually, make it back there. I said Control, but I'm on the Mac, so I really mean Command, um, and remove that curve from the um, highlighted selection, I can go to the glazing layer, so clear glass. I'm trying to really use my layers because they're going to make it a snap to render. So up under uh, surface from planar curve, I now have my glass. And let's work on the trim. Now the trim for the door, I don't want it to go along the bottom of the door. So I want to use a command called delete subcurve. And I want to delete the pot bottom part of the curve from here to here. Now when you look at the curve, it's just like a U-shaped, right? So I want to offset that. But when I offset it, I want Rhino to cap the ends. So offset has a fantastic option. I use it all the time in architectural modeling called cap. And cap flat will offset this and keep it closed. So select the distance to offset. I think I'll put in three since I'm only offsetting on the outside and I want it to match the window. And watch what happens at the bottom. It caps it and creates a closed curve, which means if I make the trim layer current, then I can extrude. But I want to do one more thing before we do that. 
I want to move it out, in this case, minus one, and then go to solid extrude planar curve straight. Both sides I need to click off and then put in an eight. Okay, so there we have our door, we have our window, we have the trim, and let's just very quickly uh, make something that is going to show us where uh, the door handle is. So I'm going to use a sphere and I'll put it on the hardware layer and I'll just create a sphere about where I want the door handle can be. We can certainly be very accurate, as accurate as we want, but we can also kind of be you know, quick and easy here and get something to represent the door handle. Um, but maybe we want to be, um, we're at the point of the model where we're going to go out to um, one of the, you know, lock set manufacturers. Home Depot has a lot um, that you can shop through. And then um, Baldwin, you can go to their website and probably even download a model. If you can't download a model, you can probably download curves and cur generate the model from those curves. Okay, so there we have um, some nice windows uh, and doors. Let's go ahead and work with this one. Same format. Okay, so what do we do uh, with the um, window? We start with offsetting a curve. I'll make the curve layer current. Like I said, uh, this part of the class, we have some repetition that we have to uh, deal with offset and I'm going to offset on both sides and the distance I'm going to offset is 1.5. Oh. Okay, that looks right. Um, we're going to take this curve and move it to the center, make the glazing layer current, go up to surface from planar curves surface from planar curves. Okay, there we go. So we've got our glass and now we've got the trim curves that uh, that we need to uh, do the, the trim, make the trim layer current, move them out, negative one, solid, extrude planar curve, straight, eight, done. Okay, so I want to do something a little bit special with, uh, with this uh, window. Uh, I want to do a mullion. Okay, so to do the mullion, uh, let's go back to the curve layer. I'll draw a line from midpoint to midpoint, and on the outside is fine. Now, learning um, what we learned before about the offset command is going to make the mullion very easy to do. So I'm going to go up to curve and offset, and I have the cap set to flat. Let's click on both sides, and uh, instead of 1.5, I'm going to make it just a little bit uh, thinner because it's uh, a mullion. I want to make it uh, less. Uh, obvious here. So I'll offset it one unit on the outside. And then I will move that back in one unit. And actually, this was the one that I wanted to move in one unit. OK, so we've got it there. Let's turn it into a solid. So we'll go to the trim layer, solid, extrude planar curve straight. Okay, and we'll bring it back to the width of the wall, which is six. Okay, and that gives us our mullion. And we want to copy that with between. So I'm going to go to copy, transform, copy. Okay, and where am I going to copy it front? I'm going to try and pick on the front face. Turn off smart track here. On the front face, I'm going to copy it from there, but I want to be able to snap between. So let's take copy again, and this time take between, and I'm going to snap between here and here. Okay. Copy, point to copy from, 
point to copy to between, and I'm going to go back to the point to copy from and then to the end. There we go. Okay, and so the one on the other side will just mirror it, and then we will also mirror the entire window to, uh, to the back. There we go. Okay. So let's grab it in the front view. We could uh, turn it into a block, but I'm going to uh, go ahead and group it together uh, just for uh, time here. I will mirror it. Great. Okay, and once I get it over here, I'll pick it up and I'll move it down. I can see pretty well here in the right view where the openings are. I could also snap to uh, the openings. Okay, undo. There's uh, sometimes if you grab that, um, if you grab the wrong place with the gumball, you'll end up um, extruding. And this should be grouped together. Let me pick on it. It is. So what's really easy to do here is to set the view to the back. And then let's just take a look at kind of where we have this set. Make sure it's centered on that opening. And uh, again, Somehow I got all this separated, and I don't know uh, how or why, but I'm going to go ahead and grab it again and group it, and then we could try that one more time. I could also move it, let's say, from the inside corner down here. Okay, and that way we're snapping to something, and I think that looks really good. Okay, there's only one window we didn't do, but I'll leave that to you for homework using the same method uh, that we did. Uh, let's go ahead and turn well, our focus to the front of the house and um, let's turn on the layer called, let's see, what do, what do I want to turn on here? Um, framing, framing's on. Probably the rail. No, nope, that's not what we want to turn on. It seems like seems like I'm missing something, but here it is. Framing curves. There we go. Okay, framing curves layer. And let's make the framing layer current. There we go. Okay, so what do we have here? We have some um, four by fours that are going to hold the overhang up. So we'll be using those to uh, um, kind of, we'll extrude those to hold up the uh, overhang here in a moment. But I want to start with the roof. And when you turn on that framing curves layer, you'll see there's a curve that shows us the slope and the location of the edge of the roof, just uh, to save us some time. Um, so this is going to go on the framing layer and I will mirror it over the midpoint of the house. And just like we did for the primary roof, the, the main roof, I'm going to loft between the two curves. And if I have them highlighted and pick loft, it just goes ahead and brings up the dialog box for loft. Okay, so I've got that lofted. And now I've got the surface that I can construct the overhang from. So I will Go up to solid, extrude surface straight. Okay, and again, remember direction. So we have to go to direction, pick the direction, put in 10 so that it matches the main roof. Let's change the surface now from the framing layer to the roofing layer, and we'll repeat extrude planar surface straight, and we should be on the roofing layer. There we go. And we're going to use direction, pick here and up, and put in two for two inches of roofing material. Okay, 
So now that we have the overhang, let's take a look at the railing. So I'm going to make the railing layer current. Actually, I'm going to leave that one off for now. We don't need that in the way. So up under, let's make the trim layer current, and that will be where uh, we will put the posts that will hold up the overhang. So I'll pick on those three curves. I'll right click on back to set it back to the front so we know what we're modeling and solid extrude planar curves straight. Um, I'm not exactly sure how far I want them right now, so I'm just going to bring them up and I'm going to use them to help me model the beam and then we'll get the beam in place and extrude these to the beam. So I'll create a polyline from corner to corner here. Now that one didn't quite go where I wanted it to, to go, so I snapped to the midpoint. So this time when I make it, I will make sure I'm at the end point here and the end point over here. Great, okay, so we're good. Um, we need to extrude this to a height of 12, so solid. 12 inches, extrude planar curve straight. Rhino knows we're in inches, so I don't have to tell it. I just do 12. And now that I have the beam, I want to pull it up and I want to figure out what needs to be trimmed off the beam to support the overhang. So you can see right now they're intersecting. So one of the options I have here is to difference the beam from the roof, but I don't want either of them to go away. So I'll pick on the positive as the beam, I'll enter, I'll pick on the roof as the negative. But notice over here it says delete input. I'm going to uncheck that. And when I do that, both parts stay. But I also get that beam trimmed off the way it needs to, to hold up the overhang. And, the last thing I need to do now is extend the columns um, and then we'll have our overhang and our framing. Um, I could use scale 1D, but there's a, a way to do this that I think you'll like. Um, you can hold down shift and command and pick on that surface edge or surface face. So if I hold down Shift, Command, I can pick on this and I can make that longer, right? Okay, so why don't I hold down Shift and Command and do a window, and that way I can bring them all up at the same time. So if you look all the way across the front, we've extended all those columns until they meet the bottom of the beam. And we can turn on our, finally, we can turn on the railing layer. And the railing right now isn't grouped together, but uh, we can go ahead and uh, highlight it and group it together um, and mirror it and copy it so it's on the other side of the uh, guest house as well. So once I group those together, I can transform mirror from here to here. And if I want a little extra support here, I can hold down Shift and Command again, get that uh, extrusion, but that's all I want, Shift and Command. There we go. And I can take it and I can copy another one over here, but that will only affect this side. Tap the Alt key, great. Okay, and I can take both of these, including the one that I just uh, created, and hold down the shift key to add it. Okay, let's mirror it to the other side. Okay, and then we'll talk about uh, rendering. Let's do mirror again. This time I'm going to be a little more careful so I don't have to move it. Okay. Great. So there's the uh, guest house. And um, let's 
take a look at rendering here. So um, put your perspective viewport in rendered mode and you'll get an idea what materials have already been assigned. So we already have a roofing material. I think we're going to go ahead and reload that because it looks a little funny. Uh, we also have a metal material on the doorknob and then we need to figure out uh, what is the exterior um, material, what what is it going to look like? And we have some architectural materials that Rhino ships with that we'll be choosing between. Plus, you can take any texture and make your own material. So if I come up here under wall exterior and I pick on that little uh, circle, it will bring up the select material dialog box. And I want to pick the down arrow and go to the plus and import from library. So this library comes with Rhino and you can see the different classifications for glass or metal, organic paint. You can go through those and look at all the materials. There are about 3,000 of them. But I want to go to architectural and under architectural, the categories um, are architecturally um, organized. So I want to go to um, exterior and exterior, oh, that's not what I want to go to. I want to go to wall, there we go. Even though it's an exterior wall, we have to go to wall first. Uh, and then I'll pick siding. And I want to bring in a vertical siding called siding upwards. It's kind of a funny name, but maybe it translates well. I'll pick it and then apply it. And now you can see we have a really nice um, kind of uh, vertical T111 uh, siding on our um, house. Another material we can get if you go back to a uh, wall exterior, you can play around with these later. There's uh, a stucco, um, probably should be more of a beige color, but it's coming in kind of gray, but it's not bad. And then also in the model, we have one that we loaded from the library that you can go out, you know, pick the plus, go to the library and find uh, called weathered shingle. And apply that. That's the one that uh, I liked the most. So I'm going to go ahead and stick with that. But one thing you'll notice when we do weathered shingle, uh, something's wrong with the material. So let's reload the blue shingle. So I'm going to pick on it, pick on import from library, architectural. Okay, I'm going to go I'm going to go to roof, shingle, and blue shingles, the first one. Great, we'll apply it and maybe, yeah, that looks a little better. Somehow it lost its, uh, its spacing there. But what I want to show you is that the roof, if I remove the roof, the interior is also shingle and we wanna rectify that, that's not what we want. So I'm going to turn off the roof layer and I'm going to turn off the framing layer. Okay, and let's work with the inside. And I'll show you another way to work with the inside here in a moment with a clipping plane. But I need to select those interior walls. Okay, so using Shift and Command, I'm going to highlight just the interior wall face. Now, I don't want to explode it. I still want this to be closed. So Shift and Command will let me pick just one of the faces and I can in this case I picked four of them but I want to give them um, just a paint material so down here under properties I'll pick on material and instead of use the layer material I want to use a material in the model called paint okay and when I do that then I have a different exterior material versus interior material. And I do have and still have a closed solid, which is awesome. I could still 3D print this. Okay, so um, one more um, layer here to turn on. I have a wall interior layer for you to turn on. And there's a uh, pocket door into the shower and bathroom. There's also a uh, opaque glass a window here into the shower room, again, to give it more of a spacious uh, effect. And let's uh, turn 
on a layer called Furniture Layout. Now, um, we'd have to do another tutorial uh, to get this to work, um, to put in the blocks, but we could. We could go out and find a bed, find a desk. This might be, I have it set up like a little uh, studio apartment, but um, we could also put a desk out here and turn it into an office. But it's a, it has all the uh, amenities. It has a refrigerator, a counter, a place for a microwave, uh, a bathroom and a shower in case we're going to use it as a guest house. So it's super cool. Um, I want to turn back on the framing layer and back on the roofing material layer. There we go. Okay, so what if I wanted to see inside the house, but I didn't want to be turning layers on or off? Okay, Rhino has an object called a clipping plane. So I'm going to turn on the layer um, called clipping plane, and I already have a clipping plane. They're very easy to make. You just type in the command clipping plane, and you pick two corners, and there you go. You have a clipping plane. So anyway, um, but I'm going to use the one that I have here. I want you to see in the front view if I drag it down, and if I were going to use it to show the floor plan, I would probably put it somewhere around four feet. But notice the clipping plane is being used in all the viewports. So what I can do with the clipping plane is uncheck it from perspective or uncheck it for top and right so that it's only in use here. Maybe I only want it in use in the top viewport so I can uncheck it from perspective too or I can keep it checked. Okay. So this clipping plane, and you can have many clipping planes, but I can also rotate it. Okay, and when I rotate it, it allows me to experience the model by cutting through the geometry. In this case, we're going through perpendicular to the front. Okay, and I can also flip the direction. So if I want to look at it, experience it from the other side. And like I said, I can make another clipping plane or I can just keep rotating this one around. There, this one. Okay, I'm looking at how the model performs from front to back. I want to see how the layout is, you know, a section through the building. And I can create a viewport that shows the section. I might want to do this one flip direction. Okay, and show an elevation, you know, at uh, uh, the bathroom and then show an elevation at the kitchen. Maybe show an elevation over here um, where the office area will be. Okay, so that is a clipping plane. But where I wanted to use this clipping plane um, is to clip out the uh, floor plan. So... Um, the floor, I'll only make it visible on the top. I'll turn it off in the perspective. And that way, um, it makes the 3D model really look more like a 2D floor plan. But the benefit of this is that it's all 3D geometry. So if I take this wall here and I move it, it moves it in all the views. Okay. Now, what I might want to do with this one, it seems like it's coming up uh, a little short there at uh, the fridge. I might want to go inside and highlight that edge, but I also know I can do that from here, and I'll just drag it out so it's a little bit beyond the fridge. Okay, so I was able to do that without going to the inside, but if you needed to, you know you can use that clipping plane to help you out there. Okay, um, let's take a look at setting this up on a layout. So uh, I want to show four views similar um, to the PDF file and place uh, a few dimensions on here, and then we'll, we will be ready to send out for PDF output. You might also want to put the top view in a rendered mode, okay, so you can see it there. I think it looks pretty cool. 
with the uh, floor plan and we'll do that in our layout. So our layout represents the piece of paper that we're going to put into our printer or plotter. Um, you may not be the one who has the plotter. You may have to go to your print shop for that, but um, you want to set it up to the full size sheet. Now you can always produce a PDF and scale the PDF to your printer and that would be the way to go. So make it the full size sheet that you will be giving your, your plotting service. So I need to add a layout. So I'm going to go over here to my inspector panel and open up the layout panel. Now in this model, I don't have any more, I don't have any layouts, I'm, I'm making them, it's brand new. So uh, I'll pick on the plus down here and I'll create a layout. I want four details, but the sheet size I want will be landscape and it will be a C size architectural sheet 24 by 18. Okay, 24 the width, 18 is the height, pick apply, and it will take us over to the layout area. Now, each of these details that we um, that you see here can actually be double clicked on to be made active and they can have their own display mode. So this one's pretty easy. I can make that the render display mode, but I need to do a little bit uh, of work uh, here um, with these uh, viewports before um, we start putting dimensions on. Um, first of all, I want these details to be on the detail layer. So using uh, properties here, I can put them on the detail layer just to uh, keep uh, organized. And I find the layout is easier to read if the details do not touch. I think it's very hard to read if they're touching. So I just do a real quick little separation here of the details so I know where one ends and one begins. And um, with these parallel views, there's a setting to the detail that we can um, put in place, which is a scale. And the scale will be, we're going to tell Rhino, how many units on the layout equal how many units in the model? And if you're using a metric, that might be one to 10, might be one to one. If you're using imperial units, it might be one to 48 or one to 96. And when we're imperial units, we describe those as what the inch equals. So what does the inch on the layout equal? One inch equals 48 inches or four feet, one inch equals um, 96 inches or eight feet. So anyway, that's the terminology and the display that we're used to looking at in imperial units. I'm going to select all of those and set them one to 48. And when I do that, um, they are a little bit off as far as being synchronized, but there is a command uh, in Rhino called synchronize viewport. So if I double click here, S-Y-N, it will autocomplete synchronize view, not exactly viewport, so synchronize view. And when I do that, it lines up all the views. I believe you have to do this in the top view in order to, uh, to get it to work uh, best. And one other thing that we need to do here is turn on the clipping plane in the top view. And when we do that, uh, you can see now these are all to scale. Um, but I do need to lock the viewport so that I don't mess up that scale. And over here off the detail page, I can lock them. Okay, this one I want to put into shaded mode. And this one I want to put into shaded mode. Now, one thing about the clipping plane, it's visible. Um, so I can freeze it either in all the viewports or just in some. So I actually am going to just go ahead and turn off the clipping plane layer globally. And that way um, it's not visible anywhere. If we need to change it, then we're gonna have to turn it back on. But the last thing I want to do in this model is uh, place 
a few dimensions. There's one other thing I can do here too, and that is cell CRV. I can uh, pick all the curves. And if I'm working here in the model, cell C R V. There we go. That's what I wanted to see. And I can just hide them globally so that they're not showing up. Um, my render viewport is showing curves uh, now. Look what I did. <laughs> I wiped out the curves on the layout, uh, furniture layout. So I need to lock the furniture layout before I do the command called uh, cell curve. There we go, because I don't want to hide the, the layout that I have. Okay. So when you're dimensioning, there is a dimension style in place that controls the way your dimension looks, and it's part of settings. And if you go over here to annotation style, you can see that the one we have in place is called foot inch architectural. And all the settings that are here are going to reflect how um, that dimension is going to look once we put it on the model. Okay, so I don't see anything right now that I need to change here, but let's put a dimension down. Dimensions also have their own layer, so it's good to make that layer current so you don't have to change them. And I can dimension on the layout or in the model view. So when I double click on the model, you can see it gets a little bit more bright. Um, up under dimension and linear, I can create an overall dimension or I can do a chain dimension. Now, don't worry too much that the dimension disappeared. Take a look at this. If I go to display modes, they're over here, I am not showing the annotation. So if I scroll down, I'm not showing them. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on them to show, and then they show back up again. Well, one of the problems that we have right now is that, let me uh, go back. The dimension is now showing up in all of the viewports, okay? So I need to go here and I need to turn off the dimension only in this viewport. So I will pick on the viewport controls that are only going to control visibility in this detail. And that's the second one there. And I will turn off the dimension just in this detail. So now if I go back here, I can continue dimensioning and these dimensions will not be visible in the um, perspective viewport. So this time I will create a dimension from the end point and maybe to the midpoint of the wall. And after I get this dimension, I'll repeat the dimension command and I will pick on continue. And when I do, it continues with a chain dimension. And when I repeat it again, dimension, this time I will put the check mark in do not continue so that I can start with a vertical dimension. And when I place it, I'll enter to repeat that and I will pick on continue. And that way, um, I'm, I should probably be in real life here dimensioning to the center of that window, but uh, we'll just go with this. Okay, now this one, the last one that I picked, this one I have to move because it's covering up the other dimension. So this is where I can use that grip on the dimension text and I can slide it so that it is not covering up the other dimension. Okay, so these dimensions were created in the viewport. What happens if I create a dimension outside the viewport? It actually works very well and it looks identical. And the reason why it looks identical is because up under annotation, under, um, up under file and settings, in this model, we are using a feature called layout scale and when layout scale enable layout scale is on that's the lower one the lower left corner all the dimensions are created with their one-to-one -one size that the annotation style refers to 
So um, I don't have to do any special dimension style for it. It's going to look correct even if the viewport scale is different. So if I decided to show the viewport scale here at half inch equals a foot, so it was twice as big, the dimensions would still be generated. They're printed one-to-one -one text height that the annotation style refers to. So if I do dimension and linear, I'll take continue off and I'll create a dimension across the front of the house here. And we can also do, if I repeat, dimension baseline. So I can create a set of baseline dimensions. OK, and then if I make this uh, viewport active or if I want to create dimensions here on the detail, let's do continue uh, baseline off. And we, we won't uh, have that continue on. I'll do an overall height. And then I can do baseline or uh, chain dimensions, whichever one uh, you want to use for your model. Okay, so there's that height. The other height that we might want to know here is the height from the base to the top of the overhang. Great. And this could go on all day as uh, as you can imagine. Okay, up here, here we go. Okay, so this is uh, just about ready to go to the printer. Um, I can create a rectangle around the outside of the of the model. I, if I had a title block, I could just bring that in. Um, we go usually leave a little bit more room on the left for what we call the binding edge, but it uh, depends again what you do. Okay, um, the last thing I'll do here is some text, so dimension and text, and I'll create this one 0.38, and we'll type in guest. Notice that uh, if I, um, I can change the case here, so I really didn't have to retype guest house. Okay. Okay, so that's what we have here. Uh, we can highlight, we can underline, we can make bold, we can pick apply. Great. Okay, so there's the the text. Um, I might want to take this over here and fix it up for this one, but I have to tap the Alt key to uh, copy. And with this one, if I stretch this a little bit, um, there we go. I can highlight this and type in floor plan. And uh, I think everything else is, uh, is correct. Um, I also want to create another piece of text and smaller is fine, like 0.16, and this will be scale. And the scale, I don't want it underlined. I might just make it static and type in quarter inch equals one foot, but there's another way to do that. Okay, so if I put the scale in here, you know, we're used to seeing that, but what if I want this scale to update with the detail? I can put in a field. I'll highlight quarter inch equals a foot. I'll pick on detail scale. This was new in Rhino 7, so if you're doing this tutorial in Rhino 6, you won't see it. I want quarter inch equals a foot formatting, and now that's a field. So if I double, if I highlight this and unlock it, and I set the scale 1 to 24, then it updates. Okay. If I pick on it again and set it to 48, it updates. Okay, so that is 
uh, built into uh, that field is built into that piece of text. So I can uh, copy that down here. This is the front elevation. And the scale is actually linked to the other details. So I should put it in again, FX, detail scale, select object, pick on the edge of the viewport, pick the formatting because it formats well for other units of scale too. Okay. And the last one is Should I wipe that out? Okay, and this one uh, as well. Uh, maybe we know it's the west side or the north side. We could include those. Uh, last time, detail scale, select detail, and pick the formatting. Okay, so now those are all tied together. And if I were a little more careful here, I would have made sure I had the Alt key. So that leaves me. One more correction to make here, and that would be detail scale. And then we will go to print this out, pick the formatting so you get to see it one more time. OK, I think we're ready to send this out to the printer. So um, I'll pick on print. There it is if it goes to my little black and white printer. But I want to uh, save off a PDF so we can uh, we can open it in the preview. And we can save this off as a C size 24 by 18 preview. And let me just uh, grab that uh, over here. There we go. There it is. There's our house design. There's our PDF. And we're ready to send that to the printer. We can take this farther by uh, working on the interior. Maybe we'll do that uh, next time. Get some blocks and then come up with some interior renderings and some sections through the uh, interior as well. So that's a wrap on uh, today's uh, project. Let me uh, go ahead and stop the recording.